action movies. Action movies are a very popular genre of film. And some of us enjoy stories with a lot of action and activity and suspense. And often an action film, and I thought about showing you the start of several movies, but then I decided I wouldn't. But often an action movie and playing the Mission Impossible theme. And, you know, they begin with a chase or something really dramatic that draws you in and pulls you into the story and introduces the main character who is quite often in a situation of difficulty or struggle or confrontation almost immediately. And if you, do any of you like action movies? Am I the only person? If you like action movies, then the gospel that may appeal to you the most is the gospel of Mark. Because the gospel of Mark, which is the first account we have of the life and ministry of Jesus, and it starts with lots, lots of action almost immediately. And if you read it, you'll see that Jesus encounters all kinds of people and situations, and he goes from one situation to the next. And in some translations of Mark's gospel, it, you keep hearing, and immediately this happened, and then immediately that happened. And the setting for today's action is the village of Capernaum, which is on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. When we had a church pilgrimage trip to Israel in 2011, we visited this site. And in Mark chapter 1, we hear about uh, the first of what will be several dramatic healings of women in Mark's gospel. And it follows another healing story. The first takes place in the synagogue. Uh, and you can still visit the remains of the synagogue in Capernaum. First takes place in the synagogue. And then the other in the nearby home of Simon and Andrew, which a church has been built over. So you can walk into that church and you can look through the glass floor and look down and see the ruins of the house. It's close enough I could throw a baseball from one to the other. I mean, they're really in close proximity. And so the first is in the synagogue, the next in the nearby home of Simon and Andrew. The first involves a man, the next involves a woman. The first case is one of demon possession. It's a little... The second, it's an ordinary fever. And in Mark's gospel, what you see is Jesus heals all sorts of problems in all sorts of people, in all sorts of settings, and then we see how the individual responds. Listen to Mark chapter 1, beginning at verse 29. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. And they told him about her at once. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her and she began to serve them. This is God's word for us for this morning. Whenever I read this passage, it makes me smile when I think about my Roman Catholic friends. Because Roman Catholics look to Simon, who was later given the name Peter, as the rock on whom Jesus builds the church, like the first pope and everything else. Yet Simon was married. He had a mother-in-law. The story is about Simon's mother-in-law. And yet priests can't be married. I still don't understand this, but I'm very grateful to be Baptist. <laughs> Another reason this story makes me smile is that five men, at least five grown men, enter a house and they learn that one older woman, Simon's mother-in-law, is sick in bed with a fever. Now, what do you do when you get home from worship? A lot of people have something to eat, right? So these guys have all just come from the synagogue. And they come in, and Simon's mother-in-law is sick. So naturally, they tell Jesus about her. He comes in, takes her by the hand, lifts her up. The fever leaves her. And she begins to serve them. They don't make chicken soup for Simon's mother-in-law. She begins to serve them. I would make the argument this is one of the most practical healing stories in all the Gospels. Right? <laughs> she immediately begins to wait on them or to serve them food like a good Middle Eastern mother would, of course. Now, we never learn Simon's mother-in-law's name. She's just an ordinary woman, and faith 
is not even mentioned in regard to her healing. Do you know that? It's nothing on her part. It's all on Jesus. Yet this will be the first of many passages in Mark's gospel that makes a woman a model of discipleship. Her response is the response that Jesus is looking for in all of us. Her response is, once I'm touched by Jesus, I'm going to serve others. When you're touched by Jesus, when you're healed by Jesus, when the grace of Jesus touches your life, the response Jesus is looking for is I'm going to serve him and others. Now, mothers in all cultures, above everybody else, mothers in all cultures and times understand about serving. I mean, who serves like moms, right? And many mothers embody the words from 1 Peter chapter 4 that Jerry read for us a few minutes ago. And I'm going to read you part of them again, but I want you to listen to them this time, thinking about the possibility that Peter was remembering one of the first dramatic acts of healing that he witnessed Jesus do, which was healing his own mother-in-law. And then seeing how she responded to what Jesus did for her. Because I wonder if Peter had his mother-in-law in mind and remembered this moment when he wrote, above all, maintain constant love for one another. For love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. She had been sick in bed a moment before. She doesn't get up and say, what are you guys doing here? Be hospitable without complaining. Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another. With whatever gift each of you has received, which is exactly what she did. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies. God had literally supplied her the strength she needed. So that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. I wonder if Peter had his mother-in-law in mind when he wrote those words. Like Simon's mother-in-law, you were made to serve God. And whatever you're good at, you can be doing for God, for the church, for your community. And at BBC, there is an extensive list of ways for all of you to serve and ways you are serving. There's probably more than 50 different ministries, groups, or events in which to serve God and our neighbors. And yesterday, our trunk or treat event was a great example. You know, we had so many people here dressing up, decorating their cars, helping with games, with face painting. And there's so many people I could name, right? There's so many people I could name. So don't, if I'm mentioning trunk or treat and you were there, you're included, okay? But I'm just going to, Jim Decker, who many of you may not know Jim, but I've known Jim for 20 years because of the white caps and other things. Jim is a salesman and a marketing guy. That's what he's done for his career. He was walking around that parking lot yesterday actively trying to find kids and get them to go over and get a tattoo. And he was, it was so funny. I talked with Jim multiple times, but... It's a natural part of who he was. It's a way it, Jim was doing what he's trained and gifted to do, and he was using it for God and to reach other people and to help other people. That's just one example. So many people yesterday were doing that. Are there any more photos of that? Is that it for now? Very good. We'll, we'll have a video of that a little later on in the service. So we were put on earth to contribute to the kingdom of God and the common good, and there are lots of ways for everyone to contribute at BBC. Let me name a few. Sunday school teachers who give up their time and embody the love of Jesus for children, students, and adults. Our caring nurses, our cooks who care, the community life and fellowship team, and all those who serve by making sure that there are refreshments after worship and summer breakfast to encourage people to linger and visit with one another. Our wonderful folks who serve stocking the caring cupboard and meeting our neighbors every week and sharing food and a caring smile, the caring heart-to-heart -heart te team that does an excellent job hosting receptions after we have a service when a loved one has died like they did on Friday after the service we had for our longtime member Marie Knight and 
our deacons who are here every time we have a memorial service, greeting families, serving them, helping them to feel at ease and to be comfortable. We could talk about those who serve by visiting members and friends of the church, sharing a caring presence, reading to people, bringing an encouraging word, the members of the worship team who are here every week serving through music to bless the Lord, the worship welcomers who greet you every Sunday, our media team without whom we would have nothing up on a screen and no recording, no video, no online worship. We would have none of that without the dedicated folks in our media booth, various ministries we have that serve men and women, our office volunteers, the list goes on and on. There are all kinds of ways that people are serving just for us to do what we've done the last three days with a memorial service, trunk or treat, and worship today. If you add up all those people, I would bet you it's close to 50 to 75 people, conservatively, who made just these three days happen. There's an old hymn that we don't sing at this service, but uh, it describes the awesome greatness of God by saying, whose robe is the light, whose canopy space. And you know, a lot of folks can fit under God's canopy, and there's room for all of us to find our place of service and belonging. And we all have a part to play. Each of the ministries and the people that make them happen, they're kind of like the spines of an umbrella. Have you ever had an umbrella where all of a sudden one or two of the spines gets broken? How well does that umbrella function? Do you keep it? It's kind of like pointless, right? Once one or two of those spines of an umbrella go, you're like, oh, we're out of luck. This just isn't going to keep the rain off me like I want to. And the whole umbrella loses its shape and becomes less effective. And the same is true in the church. You know, if we have even a couple of those spines just don't have enough strength, Things come down. And, you know, even as we get older, even if we don't have the physical capacity we may once have had, we may not have the energy we may once have had, we can always continue to find ways to serve. We can pray for other people, for the church, for our volunteers, for the staff, for us to reach people for Christ. You can text people. You can email people an inspirational message. Let them know you're thinking of them. You can send cards to people as our deacons do. Ellen and Patty do an amazing job sending cards to people who are sick, coming home from the hospital. We send cards on the anniversary when people have lost a loved one. There's all these things that happen, uh, many of them behind the scenes. And as Mark's gospel stresses repeatedly, Jesus came to serve and to give, to serve and to give. And serving and giving are simply a natural part of our life as well. And Jesus says, we're servants of God by serving other people. And Jesus also makes it clear it's by serving others that we help to train ourselves away from selfishness, arrogance, envy, and resentment. Rick Warren in his famous book, The Purpose Driven Life, said, if I have no love for others, no desire to serve others, and I'm only concerned about my own needs, I should question whether Christ is really in my life. A saved heart is one that wants to serve. A saved heart is one that wants to serve. Like Simon's mother-in-law, you're called to serve Jesus and others. Henry Nouwen wrote, no Christian is a Christian without being a minister. In whatever form the Christian ministry takes, the basis is always the same, to lay down one's life for one's friends. We know we've reached a level of spiritual maturity when we stop asking, <laughs> who's going to meet my needs? Who's going to serve me? What's in it for me? And we start asking, whose needs can I meet? Who can I serve? What can I do to help? Mature believers are more concerned with serving and reaching out than about our own convenience and comfort. And as we grow as disciples, our attitude hopefully starts to shift from, I'm looking for a church that blesses me and meets my needs, 
to I'm looking for a place to serve and to be a blessing. Because ironically, when we seek to serve and be a blessing, guess what you end up finding? You end up being blessed and finding your own needs are being met. Yes. Way back in a previous century, I did a doctor of ministry program. And the thesis for my doctor of ministry was titled, Every Member a Minister. Every Member a Minister. And I wrote about how I'd like to get to a point where 100% of our people were serving others for Christ. Because simple acts of service, just the genuine practice of loving your neighbor as yourself, leads to transformation in Christ. And we pursue loving and serving people in need because Christ loved and served first. He just set the example for us. And God has equipped all of us to serve uniquely. And that service leads to changed hearts. It leads to dynamically changed lives, both for the one who serves and the one served. And the eternal value of transformed lives for Christ is found in significant relationships that we build as we serve together. I'd be willing to bet there are a number of you who have been at our church for a little while now who would say some of the people you're closest to are the people you serve with in this church. The team you're a part of, the group you're a part of, that's where those relationships really deepen. So at BBC, our goal, we haven't got there yet, is to have 100% of our people engaged in ministry. We want to help you understand your God-given spiritual gifts, your calling, your purpose. We want to unleash you to live out your passion. Because whatever you do, whatever skills you have, you can use them for God. The well-known prayer of St. Francis expresses this other-focused, ministry-oriented spiritual maturity. When Francis prayed, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light, and where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it's in dying that we are born to eternal life. As this prayer of St. Francis expresses so well, servants give their all and take responsibility to serve their master rather than sitting back and complaining because no one's doing anything for me. One person contributing or failing to contribute can make a significant difference. A priest received a letter marked, please give to Harry the usher. And it was handed over to Harry, and this is what the note said. Dear Harry, I'm sorry I don't know your last name, but then you don't know mine. I'm Gert, Gert at the 10 o'clock mass every Sunday. I'm writing to ask you a favor. I don't know the priest too well, but somehow I feel close to you. I don't know how you got to know my first name, but every Sunday, every Sunday morning, you smile and greet me by name, and we exchange a few words about how bad the weather is, how much you like my hat, and how I'm late on a particular Sunday. I just wanted to say thank you for taking the time to remember an old woman, for the smiles, for your consideration for your thoughtfulness. Now for the favor. I'm dying, Harry. My husband has been dead for 16 years, and the kids are scattered. It's very important to me that when they bring me into the church for the last time, that you will be there to greet me and to say, hello, Gert. It's good to see you. If you're there, Harry, 
I'll be assured that your warm hospitality will be duplicated in my new home in heaven with love and gratitude, Gert. Don't think there isn't any place of service that can't make a kingdom impact in someone's life. When we use our gifts as servants of the Lord and servants of each other, whether gifts of hospitality like an usher or a worship welcomer or mercy or teaching or whatever else we're doing, we're touching lives often in greater ways than we may know. I use a lot of sports stories because that's part of who I am. So let me give you an opera story today. Giacomo Puccini, of course, a great Italian, wrote a number of wonderful operas, including La Boheme. And when he was in his 60s, Puccini got cancer. And he decided to spend his final days writing his last opera, Turandot, which is one of his most polished and beloved pieces. And when his friends and his disciples would say to him, you're ailing, you're sick, take it easy and rest. He would always say, I'm going to do as much as I can on my great master work, and it's up to you, my friends, to finish it if I don't. And Puccini died before he could finish the opera. And now his friends had a choice. They could mourn their friend and then just go back to life as usual, or they could build on his melody and finish what he started, and they chose the latter. And so in 1926, at the famous La Scala Opera House in Milan, Italy, Puccini's opera was played for the first time, conducted by the world-famous conductor Arturo Toscanini. And when it came to the part in the opera where the master had stopped writing because he had died, Toscanini stopped everything. And he turned around and he faced the audience. And with tears welling up in his eyes, he said to the large audience, this is where the master ends. And he wept. But then after a few moments, he lifted up his head and he smiled. And he smiled broadly and said, and this is where his friends begin. And he finished conducting the opera. Where our master Jesus ends, as far as his death and his resurrection and ascension, is where his friends and disciples build on the melody that he began using our spiritual gifts, our passion, our abilities, our talents, our skills, our personality, our experiences as a community of servants in the power of his name to help others along their journeys. Whatever you're good at, you can be using it for God. No matter who you are, no matter where you are, we can be an instrument of God's grace and peace. I want you to look at your bulletin. There should be a yellow insert in there. I'd like you to please take it out. I want you to look at it. And this is, for those of you watching at home, this is available in the buzz that was emailed out. You can also find this on our website, brewsterbaptistchurch.org. And it asks for your contact info at the bottom, which we never sell, almost never. No, I mean, we never sell it, of course. But it also asks you just to tell us, if you're involved in serving at BBC, let us know where. You know, whether that's as a welcomer on the worship team and the media booth and children's church and nursery, fellowship, whatever it is you do. If you're serving, tell us where you're serving. If you don't yet have a place of service at BBC, I really want you to pray and think about where can you make a contribution? How can you help the spines of our umbrella be as strong and as comprehensive as possible? And I want to encourage you. I didn't want to make this too high pressure. I was going to say, I'm not going to let you leave until you fill out this yellow insert. But I really encourage you, if you have time to fill it out this morning, 
fill it out and leave it at the information desk. If you don't fill it out this morning, I want you to commit to pray about it. If you have questions about some of these ministries, you want to learn more about it, sell yourself. I'm going to ask a pastor about this this week because every single one of us has a part to play. And you can make a contribution that will bless the Lord and bless other people and enable us to reach more and more people who need the good news of God's love and Jesus Christ in their life. And we haven't listed all of our ministries, but we've lift, listed some of the areas where we especially need some more help and some more engagement and support. Uh, and right at the top of that list is the tech booth and the media booth because we've lost a number of people there and we're reliant on just a few few people so please look at this fill it out if you can leave it at the information desk before you leave the church today that would be great if not absolutely bring it back by next sunday and tell us how you're serving how you might be willing to serve and keep these areas in prayer would you just pray for these areas in the life of our church as well all right okay you can unlock the doors well we're going to let them go we're going to trust them and as you think about filling this out, remember, above all, maintain constant love for one another. As Peter said, for love covers a multitude of sins. And like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each one of you has received. Serve with the strength that God supplies so that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, like with Simon's mother-in-law, we pray that you would come into our house, enter and heal the fever of our sins, whatever they may be. Each of us is affected by one fever or another, and we all need you. So we invite you to come into our home, take our hand, lift us up, and heal us so we may serve you and others. Amen.